I've, um, I've brought this along because I've only done a couple and it dawned on me that I might not remember how to do it or what a donkey looked like. <laughs> I usually have my phone and I keep scrolling, so it's for guidance. <laughs> so um, there's a slideshow happening and it will switch between um, my hands so you can see what I'm doing and also there's other pieces of work for you to look at. If anyone's got a question, just shout it out. Um, and I really welcome questions. So um, everything I make has to be hollow, and the majority of it are done through pinch pots, um, all the smaller pieces. Uh, I have um, achy thumb joints now, so my husband kindly throws all my pots for me. So instead of pinching them, um, he has a list in his workshop of all the different sizes for the different animals, and then I just put my order in. So um, mule size was ordered, um, and he's thrown them for me. So um, I use earthstone hand-building clay, which is, um, it fires to a nice white, so it takes the really bright colours that I use really well. Um, and it's, it's gritty, but not really rough, but it's very, very strong. So um, I'm doing a sit-in piece today. I have previously demonstrated standing, um, and that is a little bit nerve-wracking. Um, we've had a few instances where Andy's had to run up and rescue something that's wobbled a bit. So I've gone for an easier option. So yeah, it, um, regarding materials or techniques, do shout out if you've got questions. So I've got the basic shape, um, and then working from the inside out, I stretch it and start thinking about the shape I'm doing. So all my bull terriers are made this way. And with the larger horses, all the bodies are made with this technique. Score in the join. When you're pinching your pots or throwing them, you can do it by eye or weigh the clay. And if you start off with two equal amounts of clay, then your pots should fit together really well. Oh, I forgot my brush. So I'm going to slip the join. I've just mixed water and clay in a little clay pot there. And do the other side. So I, I use this technique for the medium, small and medium sized pieces. Um, and then for extra large pieces, I don't think I've got an example on my stand of an extra large piece, but then I would coil it. Um, and then pieces like the elephant are slab built. So I'm just going over the join, blending it in. And then I'm going to reinforce it with a coil. So it's, um, I'm reinforcing the join because I'm going to manipulate the shape and you don't really want it to burst open. Um, it helps also to put a pinprick in so that the air can escape. I don't use any armatures. Um, 
even on the standing pieces. So when Andy's making my pots for me, I would make a set of four legs and they're made solid um, and then they're left to go to leather hard. So they're the same dryness as the pots, um, which is normally overnight. Um, and then I would put them together. And if this were a stand-in piece, once I've made this shape, the legs would be put on. I can turn it over and stand it up. Um, and it's strong enough to stand up without any uh, support. So, um, and then all the figures can be put on top of it. Um, the only time it needs support is in the firing. Um, my first firing is my highest firing. I go up to 1180 and then I would support just underneath, otherwise the legs can wobble slightly. All right. It's nice, once you've got it at the right consistency, you need it soft enough to be really pliable, but um, strong enough to keep its shape. I've put a little pinprick in it, but it's still a sort of nice strong shape with the air inside. So I've got to remember that I'm making a mule and not a bull terrier. The legs are modelled. So, um, with, with all the legs, especially on the larger pieces, they're made solid. And then I use um, a hollowing tool or a hole maker tool um, to go in about sort of two inches down from the top, and the rest is left solid. So on a piece like this, the, I don't hollow the legs out at all. So we have back leg. I, um, I left school at 16 and went straight to a local art college on a national diploma in ceramics. It was at Rochester Medway College of Art and Design, which was a really brilliant course. Um, and lots of potters still making now sort of started there. Um, it's going to score and join. And I did four years there and did a higher diploma as well. And then joined the second year of a degree course at Leicester Poly, which is now De Montfort University, which was in ceramics and glass. But I never touched glass. <laughs> so, although I have a degree in ceramics and glass, I, I've only ever used ceramic. Uh, so, at this stage, you can carefully pick up and make sure it's joined really well all the way round. So I graduated in 92 from Leicester and um, set up, as, as do most people, I think, in the mum and dad's garage. Um, and that's all I've done since. So. Yeah, 
that's the second leg. What's so easy now is um, is sitting with your phone next to you and any difficulty you have, you can just Google an image. I remember having books open at certain pages and um, and you'd never get the, the angle or the detail you'd like. And now you can Google elephant's toes or pig's tail and you've got no end of resource right there. Right, second leg. While I was at um, the college in Rochester, it would have been the late 80s, we had the circus come and set up in a field next to the college for a week. So I spent a week sketching. Um, sadly, it was the time when they had wild animals, so there was elephants and other animals out there to see. And they gave me tickets to go to the circus because I'd been there all week um, and I went along and really hated it. <laughs> so in my mind, is an, my, my circus is an imaginary circus. I go along to Gifford's. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Gifford Circus, but it's a local one. Where it's, is it Cheltenham Way? Oxford Way? Yeah, an absolutely beautiful circus and I think that in my mind matches my circus. So looks a little bit like a sort of strange plucked chicken at the moment. <laughs> but through his hind legs on. So I'm just putting slight indentation where I'm going to put the front legs. Score. Keep a nice wide top where you're going to join so that you've got enough clay to join it on and make a sort of invisible join. Give her an elbow. bit of a fit look. I'm just going to mark where the hoof is. So once I've got the other leg on, I'm going to open up the shape and I can go inside um, and that helps, uh, you can work on the shape from the inside out.
I find it helps to keep measuring. So um, before you work on something and put too much detail in, keep measuring it up and check that you've got the proportions right. That especially goes for when I'm doing the figures um, and putting heads on people. I've spent ages before making a face and then when I offer it up to find that it's either far too big or far too small. So I just put little balls on top of all the figures, make sure I've got them right before I add the detail. And the hoof. Score. Second one. Right, so I'm not my brown melting under the lights. <laughs> right, so I'm going to open up the shape. If you take um, if you take a long tool, where you've got your join on the inside, you can go in and go over that join, which will strengthen it. And then I'm going to push out the shoulders. So keep my finger where his belly would be and then bring up, push up and create the shoulder. Yeah. And on that side. score ready to put his neck on. This is a great tool. I think it's for making patterns on pots, but it just makes scoring much easier. So get the right amount of clay, you're going to hollow it out so it will get bigger. And you get a little bit more. So when you're, um, when you're pinching out a shape as part of your either figure or animal, if you make the shape you want um, and then when you hollow it out, you're halfway there, you want to keep the point where the head's going to join. And on the bigger pieces, if you can't fit your finger right to the top, then I use the end push it, balance it on the table and push down so I've hollowed right to the top of the piece. And then start to pull down. So to keep your piece reasonably light, you can also use one of the hooked hollowing out tools. So if you feel you've got thick areas, you can go in there and thin it out. I'm just gonna get rid of some of my marks I've made.
to slightly look into the side. If you notice on my pieces, all the animals have human eyes. So they have white eyes with a round pupil. And I do that because I like to uh, be able to give the direction they're looking because you can add more attitude that way. Um, and as well, when you're making, rather than do something square, which I think is like a natural tendency, if you do something just slightly looking off to the side, it helps to give it life. It's starting to sit down a little bit, so I'm just going to make a little prop under its belly. If you'd made, um, if you make the legs earlier and they're leather hard, then they act as their own prop. But working soft, you might just need to sit it up straight, and then once that's once that's dried off, you can just knock knock off the prop. On a piece, um, like one of the figures on horses, I make it so the air can flow through the entire piece. So here I'm cutting through, so it will go through to the body, the neck and into the head. And on the figure of a horse, it will. Um, I make holes in the body of the horse and then the torso is a hollow with a hole underneath that matches up and that will go up into the neck and into the head of the person and then it has pinpricks in its ears. Sometimes with the, the horse's heads, it's, it's hard. When you're hollowing out, you're obviously changing the shape and making it bigger. So I use one of the hole makers. I've got a larger one. And rather than pinch it out, I will just go in and take clay out so I'm not making the shape larger. really useful being able to be inside and outside the clay. Um, it means you have to add less clay. When you can push out from the inside, it means you don't have to then add clay to the outside to make the shape you like. So 
so I've pushed out, they have like a little bulge above their eye socket and then donkeys had a sort of more pronounced nose bone down to their nostrils slightly broader cheeks so these tools are really great and versatile lovely straight edge and a right angle so when you're making the mouth draw in and then I use this tool a lot um, with the wider end you can just hook in and make a sort of more natural finish and then the nostrils pushed in where it's going to go and then just hook this lovely curved rounded edge tool in and twist and then you can lift it out slightly and then push it up That's ready to join now. So keeping in mind the neck's soft, so you don't want to put too much pressure on it. Occasionally, um, if I need to dry things out as I'm making, which I probably would at this stage now if I was at home, is I have a little gas torch um, and I would just, just with a matter of a couple of minutes, give, give the neck a little blast. Right, so the eyes. If... Um, if you have clay that you've been using and it's gone off slightly um, and it's, it's almost beyond leather hard, then I would use them for the eyeballs. So make a, an eye socket. I always pinprick as well, just in case I haven't gone right the way through, so I don't want to trap any air behind the eye. And then if you've got the, the really dry piece of clay that's still just about malleable, roll it into an eyeball. Um, this is really soft clay. But what it means is when you've got a lovely smooth round eyeball, you can push it into the hole without changing the shape of it at all. It's just pushed in firmly. Try and match up and make sure you do the same size for the other one. 
I make them teardrop shaped so they've got a little tail and that's what anchors them in. A little bit bigger, a bit smaller. And then eyelids, tiny little slug of clay with a pointy end. And that, I, I always lick the clay. <laughs> uh, I would just give it a little lick and put it under. You can use your brush and slip. So it just secured underneath. And then again, pointy end down to the corner. And then they sort of have a point at the top and then come down. Now at this point, whether any eyes at all on the people or the animal, don't touch the coil. Um, on the inside that's round the eye because it's a really, really clean line and you get a lovely shadow. But if you go in on the outside and blend it in. Second one. Yeah. Same again. Just around the outer edge. Well, sometimes if I've accidentally marked it, you'll go with your pin and you'll try to, to get that clean line again and, and you can't. It just leaves a really nice shadow. Right, so for the mane, with the donkeys and the zebras, I just do like a, a it's a tiny, tiny little slug on the table. <laughs> Minuscule, probably come out the clay. Um, I just do a bristle mane um, on the horses, uh, a little bit more extravagant, um, and do lots of small coils which I twist up. So I'm going to flatten the coil just on one side and it does tend to stick to the varnish tables a bit. Flatten it and then have a really thin edge. They don't have much of a mane, donkeys. And then cut the shape. And then where you've left that nice thick edge, you've got enough clay to join it on.
just give it some texture. I'm holding off with the ears because it's slightly soft. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried about it supporting them, but we'll go for it. So once a piece is um, completely finished, I leave it to go leather hard all over and then I use um, black powdered stain mixed with water which makes a really nice very very black watery ink um, and then flood it over anywhere I've made a mark so um, a lot of my decoration is incised with a needle um, so all around the eyes, the nose, any, any patterns that I've drawn on I flood with black stain and water and then um, by that time the clay at leather hard usually sucks up the moisture quite quickly so you can then sponge it off straight away um, and your piece is dry enough that as you're sponging, sponging over the eyes you're not ruining the modelling you've done. Um, and then I use, I mix up a basic white slip um, and all my other colours are velvet underglazes and oxides. So, oh, I've made a zebra tail, a donkey tail slightly different. They sort of have not as much hair as a horse, but they don't have the tassel on the end quite like a donkey. With, with the dogs... Dogs never sit like cats do with their tails neatly wrapped around their bodies. But there's such a risk of being broken that I always make the tails attached on any of the animals. So once I've added um, all my colour, velvet underglazes, oxides and the wash. It's then bisque fired and, and I do it sort of all about face. So I found that the highest temperature I can go, this, this clay will fire to stoneware but you can also use it for raku which goes up to a thousand. So it's very versatile. So at 1180 I keep all my really bright colours and I can fire on very thin legs without too much warping. That's about as high as I can go um, to not incur those problems. And then I use an earthenware glaze. So I very rarely glaze an entire piece. So on here, it's just the edge, always the eyes. Um, there are some horses that I've got in there where I've glazed the body, but I really like to have the matte and the shiny especially having the shine in the eye because you get the light bounce off it which um, also sort of adds to giving them a bit of life and then I just make a little direction where the eye's going and I think the moment you do that it then starts getting its character am I alright for time? I thought I was going to race through it so quickly. <laughs> it will be over in half an hour, but I'm not doing too badly. Yeah. So ears. Where they taper down at the end, leave yourself a good slug of clay for joining. And then, as we've seen quite often with, with the things that have a thin edge and look quite delicate, if you actually make them really sturdy, but you can bring the, the edge of the piece quite thin, so it gives the effect of looking 
like a small thin piece of flesh, but it's not going to just break off really easily. And then I'm going to go in and then right down into the body. Ears on animals can also tell you a lot about what they're thinking. So a slightly cocked ear can give a lot of expression. When I'm making the figures on horses, there's often a dialogue going on between them. As I'm making, usually the horse is fed up and the dog's being cheeky. But just these little things sort of help give you that expression. There, so I'm going to add a little bit round his cheek and then a rough and then we're done. And then on, the, on this one, just use the soft edge to slightly texture it, just really slightly, so not as much as if you were drawing in with a needle, but just to um, take away the real sort of smooth edges of the clay to look a little bit like fur. With this one here, just have a look. And, um, I think I did... The first wash um, was either red iron oxide or black stain. And then um, a very pale grey. And then I built up with two slightly darker greys. So round the cheekbone and above the eye and along the nostril, I put the darker colour to help sort of accentuate the face. Just his rough to go. Use all my bits up. And 
just going to give this a quick mix up because I know there's a slightly stiffer bit of clay in the middle. So often the most simple looking techniques can be quite tricky and when you're coiling if you get your sort of like bump 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 and it goes a bit oblong you just tap it back and you can usually get it back to round. worried it's going to stick to the table. Um, I would I flatten it now. You can use a rolling pin. And to make the edges sharp, just going to cut. This is a little bit thick. And then um, I split the edge so if the fabric looks like there's there's a couple of layers of it, I want to make sure it's not sticking. And then with your larger pointy end, let's run down the middle. Both sides. And then fold it up. remember how I do it, I've been a bit cat handed so I'm just going to bend it round this, this is a little bit cumbersome it's best to use a rolling pin and roll it out a lot thinner And then split it down the middle. But I don't want a, a dead straight line. I want it at an angle so that it lays flat. Push firmly down and then just join the top.
has a button. And then it's all finished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>